This is Ben. I am supposed to introduce Ben, so yeah. but I'll do it for a bit more formally. I met Ben actually on a, on a customer's couch. Uh, he had told me all about uh, this guy, Maddock, and gone to Burundi and he's going to start a coffee washing station. And uh, I always say your life is made up of successful and unsuccessful relationships. This has been a relatively successful one. <laughs> We've been somehow getting green samples for what, four years. Yeah. <laughs> and we, somehow we got the stuff here, we tasted the last, the coffee that's in the vineyard plant, we tasted in December, literally on Christmas Eve. Yeah. And we were emailing back and forth. We only, it only arrived six months later. Yeah. Um, and so Ben runs a washing station and make sure that the coffee we gave is delicious. And that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I should also say that uh, this is Christy, my wife. Yep. So I'm, I'm going to pull Christy in on some of this conversation today because uh, I think the Long Miles Coffee might have started, well, and there's some other friends and more friends from Durban, started back in Durban. Um, where we lived for 10 years. And my accent might give it away. I'm from a little further west than Durban. Uh, we're, we're actually from the United States. And so the story of Long Miles really is, is the journey of us as a family stepping from the United States as a couple to South Africa and having a dream and following the dream into the heart of Africa, which is Burundi. So I want to tell you a little bit about that, but also along the way, I think it's, it's only fair to, to paint a picture of what is Burundi, where is it exactly, why does it matter, and then the story of Long Miles, why this journey, why is this significant, why should you even care, and then we're going to wrap up by tasting some more coffee if you haven't had it yet, and as we're tasting the coffee, we're just going to kind of wrap up with, you know, what makes specialty coffee special? And why does that matter? And isn't you know you know is it is it okay for me to add you know you know 300 mils of milk and four or five sugar packets or is that against the law? I mean, what is this all about the specialty coffee? So to start off with, I I want to well first off I'll, I'll just introduce the family. This is this is the heart of Long Miles Coffee. It's Christy and I, and then we've got two boys, Miles and Nail and a little baby girl, Ari. And all of them were actually born in Durban under different circumstances, but that's a story for later. So to start off with, I want to, there's two contrasting views of Burundi. If you know anything about uh, African politics and the history of Africa, there's, there was a, a colonial rule in Africa, which I'm sure many of you could probably educate me on more than I could you, so I'm not going to go into that much. But Burundi in itself used to be a part of Burundi and Rwanda called Rwundi. And it was altogether under, under, at first it was under a German rule, and then after World War I, then there was a dividing of Central Africa, and then, and then the Germans came back in, but eventually the Belgians took over, and King Louis was the big tyrant, or uh, benevolent ruler, however you want to look at it, that kind of did it up and caused the, kind of the, the mess, is what we look at it, as of what's happening in Burundi we want to say. And mess only because it's now causing me to have to do uh, 29 signatures and stamps to get more in one bag of coffee. Um, and that's all thanks to the Burundians, or the Belgians is what I say. So, um, the Belgian system is bureaucracy. So, but the reason I bring that up is because now you've got this country of Burundi, which was a former colonial kind of ruled um, state, really. And the Belgians saw Burundi as a great opportunity for commodities, and one of them being coffee. So back in the, back in the 1930s, up until the 60s, the Belgians were clearing great sections of forest and land and making sure every rural farmer planted coffee. A lot of the coffee that we have today is actually from those original plants. Now, if you look at other countries like Costa Rica or Panama, where coffee is an agribusiness, not just a staple commodity, 
they're usually 15 year old trees where they're were replanted and renewed so that they can have the maximum harvest. So we're looking at our trees, which are some of them, some of them 60 years old, some of them slightly older, some of them newer ones can be 30 years old. So very old trees. And I'm also going to talk about that later. This is just kind of a backdrop of of kind of how we got into Burundi in the first place. So you have this Belgian rule. You have kind of almost, almost forced coffee plantations and then independence in the 1960s. So from there, the government took control of the coffee sector from the Belgians and then into uh, government of Burundian um, national leadership. And so they controlled the whole coffee sector right up until 2007, 2008. So 2007 and 2008, all of a sudden, now it's been privatized. And that's going to be the start of the Long Miles story. But first, the contrasting views. Contrasting view one is one day, Christy and I were driving with our oldest son here. I was giving a great point of this. It's really, really great. We don't have this in Ruby. This guy right here, Miles. So we were driving with Miles up near the Hazel Washing Station, which is in Kaya where this house blend that we're drinking now has honga in it for the vineyard, and that is one of the hills at the Hazel Washington Station. And so we're driving um, along visiting farmers in Honga and Gitwe and all the hills and farmers, and as we're driving, we're stopping to talk to a group of families. And as we're talking, all of a sudden, three Hilux trucks come and surround us Military guys jump out with machine guns, police officers with AK-47s. They're all jumping out, and I, I'm busy talking to one of the, the leaders of the hill, and Christy and Miles are just kind of kind of like wide-eyed, and my agronomist is with me, and we all kind of just freeze. And the, the head police chief is like a corporal kind of guy. I don't understand the rankings, but he's a high... Uh, you know he's, they're a big deal when you've got a big... <laughs> so he walks up to me and, and he says, he says, what are you doing here? I said, well, we're just talking to the farmers. We were from the Long Miles uh, Hazel Washing Station. He's like, why are you taking advantage of these farmers? I, I said, well, we're, we're not taking advantage of the farmers. We're, we're working together. They're choosing to work with us. He's like, we'll see about that. So he goes and questions the farmers. He said, they, he said you know, this bazooka, he's taking advantage of you. And they're like, no, he's not. He's like, yes, he is. He's paying you too little. And they said, well, and so this is the chief and some of the other farmers. They said, well, actually, he's paying us double what the government station here is paying us. <laughs> oh, well, he's using scales that are not correct. They're like, no, there's a scale here for the government, and there's a scale for Ben. And Ben's scale is always heavier. It always shows us that we're actually getting the right weight. The government is never right. <laughs> oh, well, he's not paying his taxes. And then the local administrator there and says, no, actually, he's paid the taxes, but the government hasn't paid their taxes for us, for local. <laughs> so the government, finally, the corporal's like, I, okay. He, so he comes back to me and says, well, you're doing a good job. <laughs> I said, thank you. He's like, so you can't collect coffee here anymore. So I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm trying to be very polite. I said, well, are, are we treating the farmers well? He's like, you're treating the farmers better than anyone else. He said, but this coffee's not for you. I said, I thought it was an uh, open market. He's like, no, this coffee is not for you. This coffee is for the government, and we said that you're not going to take coffee from here anymore. If you do, you're in trouble. I said, okay. He jumps in the truck and he drives away. Situations like this happen to us, um, what would you say, Christy? Once a year? Twice a year? Once a Let's month? Call it annual. We'll call it annual. <laughs> There's annual progressions of this throughout our life in Burundi. So I just give that as a snapshot, not to dramatize what we do, but the fact that this is happening all the time. Now, I'm going to contrast that with another story. Christy and I had visited um, a wash our other washing station bouquet, and we'd started this station in 2013. And when, when Christy and I started it, I'm going to get to that story just now with Christy, it was just a eucalyptus field. We started this coffee station, it provided jobs, it provided just, it just, 
we just we had a vision for impacting the community, but we didn't know how much it was going to impact the community. Well, one day after we had been at the washing station, we were getting into our vehicle to go, go back home, and all of a sudden this lady with this big basket comes running up and she's trying to stop us, and so we, we stop before we leave, and she comes up to Christy, tears are just streaming down her face, and she says, I just want to thank you. I said, before you came, before Long Miles was here, we could only send our son to school, and now I can send our other kids to school, and it's changing the world. And so I want to thank you. She gives Christy this huge basket of just bananas and just, it's like probably a whole week's wages worth of bananas. Like she's going to sell these and make a week's worth of wages. She just gives them to Christy and says, you have to have these as a thank you. You know, this is not an Africa where people are, somebody's begging and asking for just a cup of tea or something. This is a woman who is nothing. She's barefoot. She's wearing probably her one outfit she has. And she's demanding that Christy takes a basket of bananas because the decision we made is now changing her family's life. So I paint those two pictures not to make us look like we're in this danger zone and not to make us look like saints, but to give you the contrast of Burundi. So I've got a few different looks at Burundi. And like I said, Burundi is this country of just amazing people. You've got, these, you've got these rolling hills, and if you notice all these little patches of ground here, like you notice they're like little, like the, almost like a quilt. I don't know if any of, any of you have had quilts in your life, but you know, you stitch each little patch together. Well, that's Burundi. And each one of these little sections of ground is another family's field. And so one family might have this field here, and then this field here, and then this field here. And that will be their entire way to survive as a family. Most farmers that we work with have 200 coffee trees. And each of these coffee trees is producing less than one kilo of cherries per tree. So essentially what I'm saying is that each one of you, if you're having a cup of coffee in the morning for the whole year, you're drinking probably about 20 families in labor for their whole year. That's what you're, that's what you're consuming. And that's their whole annual income. So your cup of coffee for your for just one year will take is feeding twenty families, taking their kids to school, housing their houses, putting shoes if they can on their feet. So just, that's just a backdrop. And the reason that's important is because you see the land is getting smaller and smaller. Each family is an average of five children. You can imagine if you have five little plots of ground. Now each child gets one of those. What happens to his five children? So there's a real looming challenges in Burundi. And I don't want to paint this dire, hard, like the, you know, the world is against this picture. I just want to give you the real backdrop of you know, what is the landscape like. But you contrast that with this beautiful landscape. You see in the background here, this is the Kabira rainforest. Because of this rainforest, there's just this microclimate that enables the soil to be the most rich, fertile soil so that you get these amazing flavors. And this picture here is actually being taken from Konga Hill. And you've got, so it's 2,000 meters above sea level. You've got this amazing rich soil and then you've got this microclimate of moisture coming off from the rainforest. And it's creating what I think is, is like God's little petri dish of goodness. You know, you've got only amazing coffee that can come out of this ground if you treat it well. So the opportunity is that these farmers have a life ahead of them that can be amazing. And they're sitting on this essentially gold mine of coffee. It's some of the most spectacular coffee that I've ever tasted. And I think that's the start of Long Mile Coffee. Uh, the tagline for Long Miles is coffee, people, potential. And in 2010, I was in Dur living in we were living in Durban. We were working with a group called the Navigators at the University, and I was loving coffee, but I just couldn't find the right cup. So I was doing helping roasters roast a little bit, helping baristas learn how to be baristas, and 
going all, and just one of the things I got an opportunity to do was go, uh, a trading company asked me to go to Burundi and go to these washing, a washing station of the newly privatized coffee sector, cup their coffee and see if it was any good. So I thought that's a great opportunity, of course I'd like to do that. As I fly there and experience this coffee, the first time I tasted Burundi coffee, I'd never tasted it before, and I said, this is the most spectacular African coffee I've ever drank. And, and then I went, I went to the washing station and I saw how they were producing it. It was probably the most rudimentary, dirty, unmanaged process you ever, could ever imagine in your life. And, and Christy could probably tell you, I'm not Mr. Systematic. I'm, I, I like to see how things go. But when I went to this washing station as an untrained, I, I didn't know how to run a washing station, but I could see right away, if we just did this, your coffee could be even better. So go back to the, what is Long Miles? It's coffee, and the coffee was already amazing. People, and I saw the people, there's, these are not people who are just sitting back, drinking beers, just waiting for the sun to come up. No, they're out in the fields working at sunup. They're having their one meal a day at four in the afternoon. They're working hard, so they've got amazing people. And the last thing about Long Miles is potential. It's coffee people potential. When I tasted the coffee, and then saw the process style, we saw that this coffee could quite literal, literally be the best coffee in Africa. So I, I flew back to Durban, and I can't remember, if, I probably couldn't wait more than two minutes after I got back to Christine. I said, I think this is it. We've been looking for something to do in coffee, and I don't have the patience born to be a roaster. I, I don't have, Christy had done a, opened a coffee shop, with a friend that's actually here today, Lulu. And they decided that actually managing coffee shop is that's a lot of work. And you have to deal with people all the time. So maybe that wasn't the, the best thing. But going to Burundi and finding this coffee and sharing it with the world, I said, that's, that's what I want to do. I said, let's go there for two years and just kind of learn the coffee trade and introduce people to Burundi coffee. So very naively, I uh, wrote an email um, that I was gonna, uh, I'm gonna drive to Burundi and I sent this email to all these different coffee importers around the world saying, if you want Burundi coffee, contact me. And if you know anything about coffee, that's not exactly how you do it. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, there's organized businesses that have been doing coffee for generations that where you, this is how you buy coffee, this is how you sell coffee, and they're, it's international traders who control this market. So commodity traders, I was just going in not having a clue about commodity and saying, this is special, let's do this. Lucky for us, the company that sent us to do the consulting to check to see if the coffee is good said, well, we're looking for someone to move to Burundi to do this. So why don't you just work exclusively for us? I said, okay, I can do that. Not having a clue what that meant. Well, over the next two years, as, as our family was growing. We had our two boys. Our our little guy here was only how old is he, Christy? Probably six, uh, sixteen months. Sixteen months. We moved to Burundi. You find out early on that you don't tell your grandparents to Google search Burundi in two thousand ten. <laughs> Bad idea. We just come out of just coming out of the a few years. South Africa had helped orchestrate a peace agreement with the last rebel groups, and it was just a just really fragile peace. 2010 was the first real election. And it was somewhat peaceful. I was there during the elections, and they said somewhat peaceful, but I was waking up to grenades every night. I'm like, this is peaceful. It was just, it was kind of like coming from the United States and then peaceful Durban to Burundi. It was like, wow, our friends were right. South Africa is Africa for beginners. Hmm. Now, <laughs> we, so we went, and kind of with rose-colored glasses, we are going to change Burundi. And I remember one importer in the United States kind of actually laughed at me. He came to, came to visit, and we were cupping coffee, and we said, we're going to change Burundi. We're going to get them better coffee prices. We're going to get the farmers' lives are going to change. We're going to see change in Burundi. And I was like, the Obama of coffee, I guess. But, um, <laughs> and, and he laughed at me. He said, oh, that's just so idealistic. That will never happen. And so I was like, what does he know? Well, two coffee seasons in, 
we realized that we were just part of the machine. All that I was doing for the first two seasons was finding coffee, the best coffee that I could in Burundi, buying it locally as cheap as I could so that the, the Swiss trading company could turn around and sell it at a decent margin to importers who would turn around and sell it at another decent margin to roasters who had to pay for it at that price. So the roasters were end up paying a good price for it, but none of the farmers were seeing any of that. And after two seasons, I had scoured the whole of Burundi, visited 187 coffee washing stations, found the best coffee washing stations, helped them micro lot and change their processing so that we could make, get micro lots. But in the in the aftermath of that, no farmer was seeing any change in their life. So actually, that's when I think I want to. I'll have Christy just jump in here quick. And I think you told me what, I think this is, we were actually, we took a, the season was done in 2012. We actually were in, we flew to South Africa to take a holiday. And we were going to drive from Johannesburg to see our friends in the Free State. And what did you tell me? I think we pulled over on the side of the road for this conversation. Yeah, I, I think we had reached our tipping point. So. I told you we either needed to do something like fill the station or um, that would actually implement change or we need to go home and decide where home was first <laughs> and then we just needed to go there whether it was back to South Africa or um, the States we just needed to transition at that point. And so I knew from day one and I told Christy actually day the first weekend, it, uh, we, uh, I think Christy uses the term a hot mess is the, the best way to say it. I was just, I was just all over Burundi trying to figure out how to be as culturally insensitive as a person can be, getting coffee and realize that- Covered in heat rash. Covered, I was in heat rash, I was in anxiety, I was, trying, I was like trying to figure out how these Swiss expected me to pay this and then turn around and try to tell the farmers that this was a good idea to sell me the coffee and, and just struggling with this and then I knew that the washing station is the connection to the community. And they're the ones that these traders are dealing with and setting the price. I said, that's it. We have to have the washing station. And that was week one. And Christy said, we're here for two years and then we're gone. That doesn't make sense. Fast forward to Christy's story. And now she's saying we got to build a washing station or find out where to live. And so strangely, we, we actually just published a blog post and said, hey, Anybody out there want to help us build a washing station? And in two weeks, we had $40,000. And we, um, we just started building it. Um, and it is, you, if you ever visit, you can tell <laughs> that we just sort of piecemeal built it. The steps going down are very crooked. And it is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But it is ours, and it is the community's, and it is home. And so that is that was kind of our point of yeah point of the be real the true beginning of long months I think yes yeah. when that station started so we we said we we're going to realize potential because potential will kill a country it will kill a community it will kill a family it will kill an individual if it's unmet so we said we we're going to help meet this potential so we found this eucalyptus field and actually I remember actually we were Somewhere in the Free State on that highway, I don't even know the name of the highway that goes from Johannesburg, kind of. We're actually in back roads. Back so, yeah, we just <laughs> pulled over and I phoned Switzerland and I said, we're going to build a washing station so we can't trade your coffee anymore. And they said, okay. So, that was easy. Now what did I do? Now we got, now we, we don't have any job, we don't have anybody to buy our coffee, and we don't even have a washing station to sell coffee. What do we, you know, but that seems like us. We're just going to jump in and, like, because we knew we had to see this potential. We also knew that we were not, we wanted to provide, we wanted to see change happen. And it wasn't happening the way things were happening. So we found this eucalyptus field with a little river running around it on this hill. And we negotiated with the families. And we bought this hill, the side of the hill. And we cut down all the eucalyptus trees. We pulled out all the roots. and. Engineer Ben, I have an art background, so I thought I could do it. I drew what I wanted as a wash. I'd seen 187 washing stations. I knew what it should look like. I drew out the schematics of the washing station, 
And like I said, you're all invited to come, just don't laugh at it. And we, we, we started to build this washing station. We decided in December, took January to buy the land, February 7th we started to build, to pull out the stumps, and on April 7th the harvest started coming in, and we were ready to go. And the farmers couldn't believe it. We had hired about 120 local um, farmers to help us, pulling out, they were singing and throwing these stuff. They just couldn't believe it, that these crazy Mizumus were coming to invest into their community. So, but the best story out of that was, is after we took out the eucalyptus, um, at the bottom of our hill, this natural spring started to pour forth. And, and so this was, this is kind of one of my favorite stories about the start of Long Miles was that, so the local uh, hill chief came up to us and he's just, just can't believe it. Everybody's been using drinking water from the river, which is cows are, you know, drinking and doing their business and people are washing in it and then that's also your drinking water. But now we've got this spring, natural spring coming out of your hill. He said, you got, long miles came and now we have fresh water out of nowhere. I said, no, it's, you cut out all the eucalyptus and you'll have lots of springs. And he said, no, no, there was a spring before and then we did something, but you came and now we have fresh water. I said, okay, sure. <laughs> So we are the bringers of water to the community. But the, the result was, was that we started entering into community. So we entered into not just, not just finding a, a way to produce coffee, but we immediately entered into being a part of community. And that's what we knew we had to, had to do. It wasn't about just trading coffee. It was about seeing what farmers needed and being a part of the change that the community needed to have a, a livable life. But at the same time, this is a business. We had to survive as a family. So how do we do that? Well, this is 2013. And so after the first day of harvest came in, the farmers started bringing us chairs. We're still actually laying cement and building drying tables. Because at the end of the whole process is that you have all these families from these surrounding hills. And in Bouquet, we worked with eight hills. And on those eight hills, at first, that first year, we had how many farmers did we have that first year? Was it? I think it was 400. 400 farmers. 450 farmers. So 450 farmers with their 200 trees each were picking their cherries, putting them on the head, bringing them to us, and delivering them to us, and just on essentially credit. And then at the end of the season, we need to pay them. Now, I, we had raised enough money and we had sold our house in Durban so that we could build this washing station, but we never thought about how we we're gonna, oh yeah, you have to pay for labor, you have to do, uh, uh, you have to have diesel to run generators, you have to buy coffee cherries, and oh, you have to have a truck to, none of this, we were just living a dream. But also that dream was causing untold stress. I can't tell you, like, starting up business, I think many of you may have started up or been a part of a startup business before, you know what, it, kind of a getting off the ground and you're just, and now we're in Central Africa, we bought this hill, and now we're just, we have 450 families who said we'll gamble on you and we'll give our whole production, our year's work on your shoulders. So that first year was intense. Uh, we didn't have any money. Every month we were just kind of scraping together money to pay the labor, to pay for fuel. But at the end of the year, I don't know how it happened exactly, but we were able to pay all the farmers, we sold out of all of our coffee, and we were able to give the farmers a premium meal. So we had a, a couple of really amazing coffee buyers that uh, jumped on board with us right away, mainly in the United States. Um, uh, the big one was this company called Stumptown, and they've got a really big name internationally. So when they came on board, then a lot of other roasters said, oh, if Stumptown says Long Miles is good, that they must be good. But the secret is, in 2013, I don't think we were that good. The coffee, and, I, and I, it was kind of almost, I, I hate to say a sales pitch, but it was because it was so true. Was, we were giving samples of coffee to people and saying, it's only gonna get better, I promise. <laughs> and what's happened year on year since then is that it has gotten better. So that was 2013. In 2014, we, we decided that we didn't have enough pain in our life. 
so we should build a second washing station. So we, we took on some, uh, a big huge, um, essentially we took a big huge loan to be able to expand. And we saw, because we had two other communities saw what we did in Bouquet, and they said, we want this. And so we said, well, this is it. You know, instead of just like settling down and just making a business, we said, well, what are we here for? Are we here just to produce coffee and make money? Or are we here to affect change and see communities develop? And it was the latter. And so we said, okay, we'll go to out of the two communities. This one I knew from all my cupping where the best coffee should be. So I said, this is Hazel Washington Station on Gateway Hill, um, on this just this beautiful crescent valley at 2,000 meters. I said, this is it. So we started building the second one. Probably one of, uh, we thought 2013 was the hardest year of our life, and then 2014 came. And we can honestly say that might have been the hardest year of our life. So also we built this washing station. And the government in Burundi doesn't always like you to do things unless they get fat envelopes. And we just made a commitment that we were gonna, we're not gonna give anybody an envelope. We're just gonna just be transparent about everything. So the government said, no, you can't do this. But we'd already received word that we could, but they never gave us the official word. So we built this washing station, and they said, you can't, you can't use it. And so we said, huh, well, that's a problem. And then the season started, and we had, the first year we had 450 farmers, and now this year between the two stations, we had 1,500 families bringing coffee to Bouquet and Hazel. So we went back to the government and said, well, I don't know how to stop up there. They're just bringing us coffee. So the government said, well, you're, you're not allowed. I said, well, what do you want us to do? And then the local administrator said, these government stations have been taking advantage of our farmers for decades. We want to work with them. So the government said, okay, fine. Well, you can produce, but you can't say it's from Hesa. You have to say it's all from Bouquet. So we said, okay, that's fine. So we were able to do, produce coffee in 2014. But there's other challenges along the way, like we found that our spring source wasn't enough, so we didn't have enough water. We ended up having, we couldn't get the production to start, so we started trucking cherries over to Bouquet from Haza because we couldn't get the production to work. And so at the end of the year, we finally finished up the year, we sold out of the crop, and we were like, wow, that was the most intense year of our life. It can't get any worse than this. Those are the worst things to say in any country, but especially Burundi. Brings us to 2015. 2015 came and uh, we we started to get ready for the year. 2015 was an election year, and that's where. But back up. That's when. That's when little Ari was born at the end of the year, but we didn't know that at first. And then all of a sudden there was a coup d'état, and during the coup d'état, we had to decide what are we going to do because. We had gone through the two toughest years of our life, and this was supposed to be the year where we finally made it. Everything was good. We had two stations. We had families and farmers. We had 450 farmers, then 1,500 farmers, and then in 2015, we had 2,500 farmers join us. And, and then all of a sudden, there was protests uh, that turned violent, that turned into a coup d'etat, that turned into a counter coup, which then backlash into about a year of violence and underground war. So Christy and the boys ended up moving to Durban partway through the year because we all of a sudden, well, we were six months pregnant at the time, and we had to decide what to do. We, have a, we had a team of 50 full-time staff. We had 300 employees, uh, seasonal employees, and we had 2,500 families expecting us to help them survive war or no war. So, at the end of 2015, um, a couple of things happened. One, we actually made it through the season. Two, we actually we exported, but we exported late because of all the violence. But the most spectacular thing was, that was the Cup of Excellence still happened that year. And we entered in, we entered in three lots of coffee. Or I mean, two, two lots of coffee, and a third lot as an alternative. And we won number three and number eight in the Cup of Excellence. And this, this is, it's kind of a big deal for coffee people. If you don't know coffee, I guess it's like, I don't know, it's like, a, you want a curry cup. Is that, is that right? <laughs> curry cup? You've got a curry cup in hand. Or you just, you know. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Is that probably a 
something like that. Yeah. yeah. But it blew. We had been talking to our team. We said we're all about quality. So we had been moving everything towards quality. And all of a sudden, this was an international jury competition, and it said that we were not just in the top ten, but we had deserved the number three and the number eight cup of excellence lots. And the the coffee actually that the vineyard is working now with that that Warren picked up was from the number three cup of excellence lot. So this is a very special uh, lot that that came from a year that was really intense. Well, this last year is 2016, and I can't say it what didn't get worse than 2015, which is great. <laughs> and the the result of that is that we're now just now exporting our coffee from the 26 from 2016 and and when I said from back in the beginning when I t told our first roasters that we worked with I, when I gave them the first cup I said it's only it can only get better than this and I think the results from 2014 to 2015 and now the new crop that I think a few people have Warren has tried and a few other people have cupped have started to speak volumes on we've learned a lot it's essentially starting way back and having a, a dream together about the potential of coffee and seeing it and then seeing it transform into what it is today is really just essentially more than we could have hoped for. So with that, I just I just want to with that, I want to transition to coffee itself then. That's a little bit of the story. I don't know if you did you want to add anything else about that? And we'll have a chance for some questions afterwards, but just to kind of um, transition from, that's long miles, but transition to, you also want to know about coffee itself. So we've got some coffee here that, just as we're talking, might be good for the staff. And what is this coffee, Warren, the first one that we're going to have? Is, okay, so this one is the, the bouquet coffee. This is from our original station. Okay. It's from Gaharo Hill, where we took out the eucalyptus trees, bringers of water, um, the start, the heart of Long Miles. And so you're going to have a little taste of this. And really what I asked, I asked Warren to, we wanted to contrast essentially the bucket, the bouquet versus the cup of excellence coffee. And Warren did a really good job of roasting. So I think they're, they're both going to be really tasty. But it's, it's essentially to show you what coffee can taste like. But what we wanted to highlight in this as well is that when you're drinking a cup of coffee, you actually are making an impact one cup at a time. Kind of a joke I'd like to tell you is, uh, to tell people is, if you want to drink uh, just your regular off the grocery shelf coffee, that's absolutely fine. That's your own ethical choice. And one cup of that off the grocery shelf, you know, 20, 20 rand for a packet of coffee is just helping our farmers stay in poverty. So if you can stomach that, keep drinking, okay? And that's why whenever I see a roaster, I say, you got to raise your prices and give the farmers more money. And that's what direct trade really ends up being about. It's not necessarily even raising the prices. It's about knowing where your rams are ending up. Like I told you at the start of the story is when I first worked with a trading company, I was literally paying these farmers as little as I could. And the last guy in the United States, these might, these really boutique specialty workers, were paying a big premium, believing that the farmer was getting this great bonus. The reality was he didn't see he didn't see 50 cents of the bonus. He didn't see five cents of the bonus. He saw zero cents. He was getting commodity price for the bonus. And that's just Burundi coffee as a whole. I was talking to uh, Grant, Grant's around here somewhere, on, on the plane this morning, and Grant was saying that typically in, in South Africa, but also in a lot of the world, which is true, Burundi coffee has always been known as uh, a filler. You know, just, it's actually, it's, it's probably what makes up one of the largest percentages of Starbucks house blend. It makes up Folgers in the United States and Maxwell House. And these are like big, big, grocery store brands where you can buy a tub of coffee, free ground for you, for as little as like five dollars. And you know, like this, the, as much coffee as you can drink in two months kind of thing. My mom and dad taught me all about this, so. 
what, what we didn't know was that the farmers, when, when we were in, you know, all growing up, was that each of these coffees, oh, thank you. I do need some of Each of these, each cup of coffee is actually impacting the farmer's life. Like I told you that when you have when you have a cup of coffee, this is made up of usually about 16 to 20 grams of coffee. Those come, that comes to about, that comes up to uh, over 100 grams of, of cherries. So that could be, that's, that's almost, that could be almost, that's at least a huge section of one farmer's tree is one cup of coffee. So that's a huge amount of their production and their labor, and the farmers are actually not getting any of that back to them. So when we started the washing station, the whole idea was, how can we give back to the farmers? Well, one thing was, not just with money, but also with people like Epaphras. Epaphras is an agronomist. And one of the things we realized is that from the, from the early days of when Bruni handed over from the government to private section, sector in 2007, there was no more inputs. Nobody was telling farmers how to farm. So for the last 10 years, no one's told farmers how to farm or what to do for inputs or even helping them at all. And then we found out that before 2007, actually the government had done away with doing any training or inputs for farmers for the last 20 years. So essentially, we've had a generation of farmers who have not had any inputs any knowledge, know-how, or training, or skills build, skill building in how to make their coffee better. That's essentially if you were starting a business and, and you were just decided to start a manufacturing plant and nobody's ever taught you how to manufacture coffee, manufacture anything, how to run a plant or anything. So one of the first things we did was hire an agronomist. And here is a Packers walking with Miles. And Epaphras started a program called the Coffee Scout Program, and now what we have is 24 Coffee Scouts, which are essentially junior agronomists. And these junior agronomists uh, go on each of the hills, each of the eight hills, and they work with families, one-on-one -on -one with families. And so we have these 24 going to 12, working with 48 individual families, and those 48 families teach the families around them on practices such as mulching, fertilizing, doing organic uh, worm farms, pruning, replanting, and the biggest thing that we're doing now is shade trees and an environmental impact. Because we found that uh, there's a huge shift in the global climate, as I'm sure many of you know, that I've heard there's some problem with rain, potentially, in South Africa. Well, that same problem is happening in Burundi, but the, the real detrimental effect to Burundi is that the whole coffee sector is, is going from essentially the whole country is being pushed in the next 15 years there will only be one small sliver of coffee producing ability left in the country and that's along the Kabir Forest where our washing stations are. So again, I, I think we, Chris and I had an unfair advantage. We had a lot of this knowledge before we started Long Miles. We knew about climate change, we knew about the future, and we knew about these studies that were saying where coffee was going to be able to be produced. And I cupped 187 washing stations and knew where the best coffee was. Thus, we're able to find a specialty coffee. And we're able to have coffee into the future. I know that Warren is really scared that I was going to quit producing in 10 years, but you're, you we're safe in the long miles. But the real, the real problem is, is that now you have a country, a Burundi, and this is, this is something that I think we, in Africa we can really understand and comprehend is that between climate change and governance, there's a recipe for disaster that's happening in Burundi. And it's creating 400,000 families have fled the country. There has been a coup, counter coup, and there's just nonstop essentially a police state ever since. And now we're in a place where there's finally some stability, and yet, where's the hope? You know, people don't see where to go, they don't know what to do, and so a part of what specialty coffee can do is that it can provide some hope. 
And I'm not saying that Christy and I have are these bastions of light, but all I'm saying in this is that as we step forward with your cup of coffee, when you go to direct trade, whether it's long miles, whether it's working with a farmer in Tanzania, Kenya, Costa Rica, when you know the farmer and the producer, you know where the money is going. And you know how they're impacting community. And when, the in, when that community is impacted, families and lives are changed. So what, what we do is not Christy and I. It's actually working with a team. And the team of leaders has a team of managers. And the managers have a team of laborers. And the laborers influence families. And the families influence community. And now, like Christy said, we started with 450 families. And that now is at 4,500 families in 2016. So that is 25,000 individuals in Burundi. So it started off as just this dream to produce coffee. And to try to make some kind of an impact where an importer in the United States was just kind of laughing at me saying, you can never make an impact. It's a pipe dream. And now what we're seeing is that families are coming up to us with stories of their life being changed. We have administrators of all the hills that we work with. The best stories, one of the administrators from Gaharo Hill came up to us and said, before Long Miles came, people were pulling out their coffee. They had nothing to do. They were just subsistence farming. And now we have chickens, we have goats, and we have herds of cows. And if you know anything about rural Africa, that's a sign of wealth. It's like, now we have wealth. Our community has changed. And we can't take credit for that. All we can say is that we just left when maybe we shouldn't have. We took steps that were kind of crazy, and we went through some of the hardest years of our life. But the result is we're seeing lives and communities change. Now, just to wrap up, and then I'm going I'm to leave a couple minutes just so that as you have some questions about different things, I just wanted to highlight a couple things. I think a lot of this a lot of people here know coffee. There's some people here who just like a good cuppa. And some of us only knew Wimpy up until a few years ago. I don't know. Um, coffee. I had one this morning. It was, you know, just I stayed within the South African mode. I did. But there's a couple different processes. And when you, when you, I want you to think about coffee, you can think about like Burundi coffee, the typical is called fully washed. And that's what we're drinking. <coughs> we're drinking here today is fully washed. And what it is is the cherries come to us from these four and a half thousand families. They bring us the cherries, and essentially we strip off the skin of the cherry and we ferment the seeds in these big cement vats. And then we rinse that off and actually, I, sh I should have put the video of Christy and the other ladies, they get down in the, well not every day, but get down in these big vats, it's like a wine stump, like a, you know, like those, like, idyllic, you know, Italian countryside where you're stomping on the... We do that every day onto this coffee. If it tastes like a little toe jam, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and then we put it into a second vat, and it's filled with clean water, and it's fermented a second day. And that's through a grading channel, which, which these, these last guys are doing here. Essentially, it's, it's, dense, it's rinsing off the mucilage and sorting out the best cherries from the less quality ones. And then, sometimes we get Miles to help out with that too. And, and then the coffee is rinsed for six hours and then put on these raised tables and where they, by bean by bean, they're able to, they're able to triage or hand pick out any defects. And then they're laid out on big tables in the sun for another 15 to 25 days. So the process, we have how many we talked about this before, it was like eight hand sorting processes up until it goes to the dry mill. I think oh, we... Up until, yeah, but then even more at the dry mill. Yeah. So at our washing station, we have eight quality control steps. That involve hands. That involve hands and some feet. Um, and then at the dry mill, it goes to the dry mill and it goes through density sorters and, and, and size and it's all these different machines to get only the uniform beans with the highest density, and then it's gone through another two times of hand picking after we've hand picked it eight times. And then it gets put into Grain Pro, which is like a big plastic bag so that it seals off all oxygen. 
and it's sent around the world. This is the drawing table where the, it's in the sun. Now, that's specialty coffee. To contrast that with commodity coffee that you're going to get off the grocery shelf is the cherries are come in, they're put through the machine uh, to take off the skins, fermented and put in the sun and never sorted. And then it's taken to the dry mill, put through the dry mill, sorted by just by density, put in bags and sent. So instead of doing that, we're adding eight quality steps at the washing station and another two steps at the dry mill to make sure that you get the cleanest, brightest coffee. And the result is a tastier, cleaner, more sparkling cup where you get these nuances of flavor. I think in South Africa, a lot of you, especially in the Western Cape, know about uh, wine, or a few of you might have tried a glass or two in your lifetime. And I would attribute coffee tasting, which we call cupping, to tasting wine. A lot of the same nuances are coming out, where you're getting fragrance off the dry grounds, you're getting aroma when it's wet, you're putting it in your mouth, and when, when we cup, I don't know if you ever had the opportunity to do a cupping, but you you take you take a, you take your coffee in a spoon and you and you're and you're slurping, and it's a, it's a real exaggerated and drawn out process to really get the flavors, and the result is that you get different flavors of coffee by different processes and different hills and different terroirs. The average Burundi, if you were just buying a commodity Burundi, is going to taste like coffee. Is I guess the best way to say it. No, it's coffee. When you have a specialty product, what you're doing is you're taking this beautiful raw material and, and crafting it and carefully tending it until all of a sudden you have this amazing fruit forward, citrus tasting, full body coffee where you get specific flavor points. You can't get that without taking care of it. From the farmer, where our agronomists and coffee scouts are helping the farmer at the field level, to the washing station where we have eight different steps of processing, to the dry mill where we do another two additional steps of processing, until the roaster here, where they have to, they can, they can get here and then you as a roaster can really mess up all those people's hard work. So, Mm -hmm. So just know that it's taken a lot of people a lot of time to get there and then to the final cup where the barista has to prepare it and that's why baristas are so important. You, could, you are affecting the lives of so many people by the time it gets to this cup that you're not just having the thing that makes Christie's life better because I'm not grumpy in the morning, but you're also having something that is literally affecting lives. So I would suggest that, like I said earlier, when you're having when you're having coffee, you can have a normal cup of coffee, and if it's a normal cup of coffee off the shelf, it's actually promoting poverty. When you're having a cup of coffee where you know who grew it, you know who the producer is, and it's a direct trade coffee, you can help change communities, change families, and change lives. So that's just a little picture of Long Last Coffee. Um, I, and, and also, and what we're trying to do in Burundi, and we're gonna have some time to really talk about this more, but you know, really this is, this is what the vineyard got into. When they said, you know, we don't wanna just have a cup of coffee, we wanna do something with a relationship that matters. Something with a product that's actually gonna be special. So thank you, Vineyard, for being a part of what we do. Because we couldn't do the impact in communities without partners that roast and present coffees like this. So I think now we've got the Cup of Excellence coffee that we're going to hand out some of those just to taste. And as we're tasting that Cup of Excellence, that is, um, is, it, is it now, where is that now on at the... Yeah, you can order the cafe, the long, long cafe. Okay, so I've got... Long. All right, so if this has just been released now at for at the cafe here. So essentially, it's an award-winning coffee, and it's just... What it is, is it's an ability... It's just what we're able to do when we have partners who believe in what we do as a, as a producer. It's affecting change now to 25,000 individuals. So 
thank you for listening. I appreciate this. And I don't know if there's any questions for specifically for Christy. I'd like to take all the credit for the images today, but Christy might say otherwise, and actually most people would. These are all Christy's images, um, and she's really the one helping to tell the story every day through what she writes on the blog, which is longmilescoffee.com, and the Instagram account. But any questions about Long Miles, Burundi, specialty coffee, what you should be tasting in the cup, what you shouldn't be tasting in the cup, Yes? Um, you mentioned that you were working with trees that were 60 years old or whatever. Yes. Um, is the whole of Burundi using the same type of flavor and trees and, and everything? I, I noticed you had a replica on the sax there. Yes. That's a, that's a good question. The Burundi is 100% arabica. So there's two kinds of varieties. There's a robusta and arabica. And robusta is this really kind of kind of bitter, bold, and high caf highly caffeinated um, bean that is uh, traditionally in a lot of uh, espressos, especially Italian style, because they burn them usually, just to cover the taste. And Arabica is this sweet, high altitude um, bean that has to be hand-picked and is a specialty product. It can be or commodity. And Burundi specifically has just one variety of coffee. It's called Bourbon. And there's a little bit of a hybrids off of that, of Jackson and Marisi, but those are just essentially being bred out. And so you can safely say that you're drinking 100% Bourbon coffee, which happens to be my favorite. So we're in the right place. So I would say that in general, the with that, it, the general flavor for Burundi coffee is is fruity. If you're just going basic flavor, it's fruity. Orange, you say maybe some caramel and fruit. A little bit of jam. A little jam. Like that's the base. Like if you're not getting that, it's probably the roaster's fault. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. Red, yellow, buds. What's that? Red, yellow, buds. What's that? Red or yellow or buds. Red. So it's 100% red bourbon. And actually, the government has made it illegal for us to plant anything else. We're waiting for a disaster to hit Bobo so that we can really do it. As long as you never put in SL28. Yeah. No <laughs> SL28, no uh, no, really no of that. It's illegal. So we, we've got, we have we planted two Pacamara trees just for fun, hmm. but we can't legally tell you that. I mean, <laughs> well, I didn't know if enjoy it. Can I get one of them? Can you explain a little bit more about what you sorting out? Like, 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 yeah. So, one of, the, one of the major defects in Burundi coffee is potato defect, which you're going to get from commodity coffee. And it just it smells and tastes like a little bit of potato, raw potato. potato. And it's something that you cannot get away from in Burundi. So, when you're doing the specialty, Coffee. These eight. These eight steps. Essentially, you're looking for any insect damage. Is the biggest thing you're looking for because insects would be is the main introducer of bacteria to the seed, and it causes this potato defect. Is what it's called. And so when we're doing the the hand picking, we're really looking for insect damage, and you can't see that when it's dry. You can only see it when it's wet, and that's. That's why it's very important where we do pre-drying. So we do two days of pre-drying, which is essentially under shade. The coffee's under shade for two days, and we're looking for defects on this. And it's also why our agronomists um, are out on this guy here is out fighting against what's called the intestine bug. And this intestine bug, you can see in his these jars behind. But he's actually holding them here. He's um, it's say no to intestia in our coffee. It's this whole campaign called integrated pest management. And since we've got, on the school breaks, we get all the school children and we do coffee camps. And the kids go out and they collect these bugs. And the first um, children to collect 500 bugs of these intestia bugs get their school books paid for by long miles. Hmm. I'll tell you what, we thought we'd get like 10 kids coming in. Well, all right. The first day we did it, it, it took literally two days 
and and we had twenty five thousand bugs. Right. <laughs> to stop the competition, we said we can't buy any more bugs. Twenty five thousand in testing bugs. These little bugs are the number one culprit for two things: one for the potato defect, and two for the decimation of Burundi's coffee crop. One. And testing bug can kill 40% of a coffee farmer's production. So if I told you today that I could give you the answer to increase your bottom line productivity by 40%, would you listen to me? Yes, yeah. I think every one of us would. So essentially what we're doing with these agronomists and coffee scouts is giving our farmers 40% more of their crop because we're helping them catch and it's all organic. So to be honest, most of it's by hand. When I say organic, what I mean is literally scouting and grabbing the bugs. And so the kids love it, they collect them, they get their school books taken care of. And then we also have a product called Erythrium, which is a which is a plant that's grown in Rwanda that's made into a spray, we spray the tree. The bugs just drop out of the tree and spot spray the trees. And, we just, and it doesn't kill them, it just stuns them. And we have to, so we have to collect them and put them in jars. <laughs> Most beautiful bug I've ever seen. They're just gorgeous. Um, but they're really deadly. So the trees. So that's a good question on that potato defect. What we have seen is a huge reduction from 2013 to 2016 of the potato defect. Yeah. How have things been going in general with the coffee industry since um, they privatized? So the better was the same. Wow, that's a that's a that's a how much time do you have? <laughs> um, I'm I'm a huge fan of free trade and open markets. I think that privatization is always the answer. Um, I, I look at the way the government does things around the world and I don't see that it's, in, in, in general, it's not the great help that most politicians think they're doing is not happening. I'm not saying that about South Africa. Um, just, just, uh, just, uh, just in general. Um, but, so I see the potential of the privatization of the Burundi coffee sector of, is, is, is its own help. The way it was going with the government-controlled coffee sector, it was destroying the coffee sector. People were pulling up all their coffee trees, and they were on, they were on a trajectory to lose total coffee production. So now we're seeing a turnaround, and the production is actually increasing substantially. So, and because of that increase of Coffee is actually the only way for Burundi to have any hope for the future because 70% of the GDP of Burundi comes from coffee. So, and now that the United States and Europe have pulled all their aid from the government of Burundi because of what's happened in the last year, that means the only thing left was two things. One was the UN um, because they hired Burundi soldiers to do peacekeeping in Somalia and the Central African Republic. And the second thing was coffee. Those are the only two income earners, foreign income earners for Burundi. This last week, there, there was an incident, a decision by the government of Burundi to pull out of the ICC, which you may have heard of. And the aftermath of that me meant that two days later, the UN said, pull out all Burundi peacekeeping forces from the Central African Republic and Somalia. They're no longer going to hire Burundi soldiers. So the last non-coffee income earner for Burundi is now gone. That means only coffee can make an impact in Burundi. So there's a lot of good and a lot of bad with that. The good is that what an opportunity for companies like Long Miles to really make an impact, not only for our farmers, but for the government. Like we pay a lot of tax. So our tax is helping pave roads and make sure the water works and make sure the lights are on. The bad is that it's only companies like Long Miles that are paving the roads, making sure the water's on, the lights are on. So that does have some potential strains down the road. People versus coffee. Yeah. How much more does a, a, a Long Mile farmer get than, than a commodity a, a farmer? They make farmer commodity more. If the if the other washing stations uh, pay their farmers. Um, we are traditionally or typically on average paying 45% more. Now, I say if they pay because we are working in a country now where a lot of our neighbor washing stations weren't able to pay their farmers for the last uh, two years and they just paid for 2015. 
coffee now. So we're actually paying um, like 250% more because the neighbor, the neighbor farmers that are not working with us haven't been paid since 2014. They just got paid last, I think it was last month, they got paid for 2015. So that's also why the rise in participation in Long Miles is because farmers are walking further and further and further to come to us to work with us because we're actually, even if we paid half of what we paid, we'd be getting, giving them something. But instead we're giving 45% more than the, those who are paying. earlier you were going to talk about what, so I'm just fascinated as a novice, what should I be looking for when I taste the coffee? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely tasting lots of nutty flavors, some very interesting flavors, especially when I don't put milk in my coffee. But, you know, I, I suppose, I, I just wanted to know, do you still enjoy putting milk in your coffee? <laughs> I. It's a good, very good question. I, I, I'm an advocate of drinking coffee. So if you love milk and sugar and a vanilla shot, I think put it in. Just make sure you got direct trade coffee. That's such okay. A now that said, I personally don't like to adulterate my coffee. So I, I drink it black, and the reason is because you can't taste the flavors. And then you can take it a step further and say, how do you roast the coffee is also going to either accentuate or kind of cover the flavors of coffee. The darker you roast the coffee, the more uniform it's going to taste just like roast. So it's just going to taste always like chocolate and caramel. You know, it's like, oh, wow, that's chocolatey. Well, any coffee can taste chocolatey if you just burn it long enough. So the idea is not and that some people roast it so light that all you're tasting is grass. That's the, that's the flip side. So the ideal is to find a way to get a roast to accentuate the best flavors of the coffee. So when I'm drinking uh, some of the best lots from Long Miles, what I'm looking, the first thing I'm looking for is it should have fruit in it. And usually the best of our coffees have, I, I believe, is red berries, like raspberries, blackberries, uh, cherry, and then if you roast it in a certain way, you're going to get a lot more caramel, or as Grant likes to say, truffle. Truffle, there you go. <laughs> and, um, and then, so, so there's, and there's kind of, I, I, I look at our Long Miles coffee, there's two different, two different real flavor strains that I'm just finding in Long Miles. One is really stone fruit, and then one is more citrus. So it depends on what you like. You know, some people love that citrus explosion of, Wow, key lime and um, zest of lemon, and then there's other ones that are just like, you know, pear and apricot and figs. So you've got these two different flavors, and that's just from terroir and microclimate. One more question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's the difference between the Long Miles and Yes. I think from I can't say exactly for all, but usually in a cheaper cup of coffee, and I and maybe some of the South African roasters here could. Uh, attest nobody this. uses robusta here. Nobody. Nobody uses robusta. They say, but it's probably a lot of it could be robusta. <laughs> Um, this is the other variety. There's Arabica and Robusta. When you have Robusta in a blend, sometimes that has, uh, it does have a higher caffeine content, so it kind of gets you ripped up a little bit. And the other thing is that it just could be, sometimes when it's darker roasted, you're going to get a lot more bitterness in a coffee. So usually the less expensive coffees are usually because they also bought less expensive green beans, which is usually that means even even people like Long Miles, we have our low grade beans. We have to do something with them. So when you, when a roaster can sell you a pack of coffee for I don't know what the pack's going these days, but if it's like if you get it off the shelf and it costs you forty rand, fifty rand, sixty rand, chances are that you're you're drinking our floor sweepings. Literally, we, we sweep the floor itself. So I'm sorry to say, but every bean has a home. 
<laughs> yes? Wait, what do you do with the old trees? You can take them out with the device. Yeah, so the old trees, what we do is we, we have a nursery and we have, we give away to our farmers about 20,000 coffee trees per station every year. And what we'll do is we'll plant in between the old trees and when the new trees grow up to be productive, then we just we uproot the old trees to just take them out so that they don't <coughs> steal nutrients from the trees. So yeah, so they're good firewood. So, less. Yep. Oh, sorry, did the, yeah. did the farmers ever get a chance to place the coffee trees? Yeah, actually, it's, that's a great question. The, there is, um, here's just one, what we do on each hill, we work with eight different hills that we, well, we're working with 16 hills, but we, we trace it back to eight hills. And what we do is we have a tasting program on each of the hills so that farmers can understand why they're picking the way they're picking. Because we, now that we have so many farmers, we actually have too much volume for our production capacity, which is a great challenge to have. So that we get to be really, really strict with which coffee cherries we accept. And the first time that we send cherries home, we will send the coffee cherries home if they're not perfect. So they have to be just right. And the farmers just don't understand because they'll open this green seed that's unripe seed and they're like, there's a seed here, and they'll open up a red one, there's a seed here, it's the same. So we, we have to show them, we use different methods to show them. One is using this bricks count, which essentially registered the sugar proteins in the, the mucilage of the coffee cherry. It's just a little handheld device, and we put the, squeeze the, the juices from an unripe and then a ripe cherry on this thing, and so that farmers can see, oh, the ripe one has more sugar. And everybody likes sugar, it's sweet. It literally shows on this little device how much sugar is in a cherry, and the red ones always have more. So that's one thing, and then the second thing is to drink it. We'll, we'll brew them uh, essentially a commodity coffee, and then we'll brew them one of our specialty micro lots. And they're like, whoa, oh, they both need sugar and milk. Well, that's <laughs> Yeah. Well, Ben, maybe you can yeah. just elaborate a bit more on what the, the cup of excellence and, and the yeah. degree of, of, of score that it compares to like a normal cupping and how much better quality of a cup of excellence is versus even a standard specialty. Yeah, uh, the, so the cup of excellence is, it, it won't even register, like specialty coffee is, is on a 100 point scale, it has to be in the uh, SCAA, it says it has to be 80 points. But if you drank an 80 point coffee right now, it, it is not very good. It's just, it's a cup of coffee. The Buckeye was 81. And the Buckeye was 81. It's like, it's good, it's, it's a cup of coffee. That's the Buckeye. It's just a, it's a 81. Now to get to the cup of excellence, it has to be, now the new standard is 86 points plus. And then to get a presidential award, it has to be 90 points plus. This one scored an 89.9. I just wanted to kick that Japanese yeah. judge that gave it. No, I'm just never going to raise that. Um, it was, it was, so this was scored an 89 and 89.9. So the idea is that this international panel is cupping and doing the slurping and finding out not just does it have hints of elderberry in it, but on a balance, acidity, mouthfeel, like how does it score? And so when you, and then you're doing that against all these other coffees, and so to be able to, so you have to at least score an 86, and then they start to rank them. And then it's usually, it's six different times your coffee is cupped. And then they eliminate, 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 until the final, they get the top 10, and then they cup them all again, and they put them in order. So this, we got number three and eight. So it was a very rigorous challenge, and it was, it was kind of one of those, we had been working hard for quality for four years, and we kept saying, we're about quality. And so to have an international jury say, actually, yeah, you do have some of the best coffee. It was a real kind of, uh, kind of like a, uh, and, and, and then immediately our managers, when we got third place, because we got the eighth place and they're going 10 to one, 10, nine, we're like, uh, and then eight. We just, oh, it was like, so, we, I was crying, dancing, we were just, oh, this is amazing. And then I was like, and then seven, six, five, okay, we, no, but at least we got one. And then they said three, it was us. Oh, it was pandemonium between our team, and we were just, and, but as soon as the event was done, they said, and next year we'll be number one. 
like the, we're not we're not stopping. So we're doing lots of things. We're like we're going to do number one. But then because of the coup and everything else, that we weren't able to have a cup of excellence now this year. So next year we will. The team says they're going to get number one. So we'll wait and see for 2017. Yeah. I just want to know, like with with the COEs, do the farmers actually get more money at the end of the day? If they do get awarded as a CV doctor, like do like Rob Miles, do you actually give the farmers more money and say, like, your crop actually won the best cup and yeah. here's more money? Yeah, we, we do a celebration, we do a presentation, and then all the farmers get another premium bonus, mm -hmm. and all the labor and the managers got a big bonus as well. So it was uh, for us, our value was that we got to say, yes, what we're doing is the, the, we win out of just we did it, we got to win. And then all the monies actually for those lots are distributed fully to the farmers. I can tell you that uh, the bucko which you toasted first, we paid eighty-seven rand fifty, including back kilogram, and the uh, CO we paid two hundred and thirty. It it is a substantial amount. Big one. And it's still a bargain for that price. So it it is. It's a bargain. Really yeah. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank Ben and Christy. They actually were people of. The year buying Bard magazine, so we're pretty privileged to have them here, and they decided to come to South Africa. Thank you for the great talk. You can see your passion. Um, I didn't realize I'd been involved in that. No, I know. It's, it's been, been a while. <laughs> it's gotten better, hasn't it? Yeah, I know, definitely. I, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, and thanks a lot for being here. And uh, we'll, we'll talk in this snacks at the end, and uh, you can try some more of the coffees if you want some more of the cereals and the silvers. Uh, uh, flask at the back, and there's also the house, uh, the vineyard house blend at the back, which has got the Nakonya in it. The con con honge. The honge. Which, you which, well, and it's also it's a honey process. Yes, and that's a honey process. Which is a very different mm -hmm. process, it's not really so much known in South Africa yet. And the Buckeyes and the pink ones, they're still left. So, right. the Buckeye we don't actually sell as a single origin because uh, we have a minimum level of 83. Um, so, we actually only use it as a blender. Uh, and it's a pretty good blender for that price, so I think it's a bargain. Anyway, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I gotta try the cup of it. I never. I never tried. I didn't try.